Da minha vida rechila na frente, em escuda na roda, le cuna não escor. Da vida na minha da flora na minha, que dá na leslica, le fura não escor. Vega na luna, na hora e na estipa, chasquins coram de liga na hora. Den ligger den for, for da hører den hik, den lover den sidste øer og ro. Hikker den padder, den higer den stel, den sjader den slet, og den hygger den stor. Hello, my good friends. How are you? My name is Ari Thirger, and today I'm going to talk about the concept of Hemingia. On a previous video about the parts of the self, I have presented you 10 concepts. I gave you a general idea of each concept and now, with time, I am making a video for each of the concepts so we can develop each one even more. Today I'm going to talk about Hemingia, which is intimately tied with other concepts that we shall see throughout this video. Nowadays, Hemingia is easily described as meaning luck, but in my opinion, Hemingia marks a very important spiritual perception of pre-Christian Scandinavia. Hemingia doesn't seem to be just one part of the spiritual self. It seems that Hemingia ends up being a force which is the product of combining all the other parts of the self, developing them, in a constant process of evolution and then we develop the Hemingia itself which forms a great portion of our own personality. But we shall develop this in a way that might be easily understood with the examples I shall give. Let's get started. The very first explanation about Hemingia that comes in the sources is that it is the personification of the good fortune of a person. Hemingia became the luck of a person in the sense that it was divine grace lent to a person. Hemingia in the written sources appears for the first time in the sense of luck, first attested in clerical sagas dealing with Christian kings blessed by God's grace. But the problem with the sources is that the great majority and the ones we often use for Scandinavian studies were written during the Catholic period of Norway and Iceland. In Iceland it was a period of transition when Catholicism was accepted as the official religion of Iceland. However, there were still a lot of heathens practicing the old ways. And this period became a religious and social mixture between pagan and Christian concepts. So in some sources we can clearly see that Hemingia and such other concepts are treated in a non-Christian context. But in other sources, Hemingia becomes something exclusively Christian and is used to express the theological concepts of predestination and divine grace. So, to understand Hemingia, we must look at the older sources and the ones that clearly deal with Hemingia in a non-Christian theological expression. Hemingia seems to have been at first associated with the concept of the philia, a soul-like protective spirit, which not only becomes the very spiritual personification of an individual, but it's also an animal spirit, the closest thing we have to an animal totem, a guardian spirit of the individual. The philia is intimately tied with Seidre, in the sense that the practitioner of Seidre can send forth its mind in the form of an animal, of his or her own philia. Furthermore, the philia is also related to the animistic notion that the person can shapeshift into his or her own philia, change one's appearance, the hamre, which is related to the shamanic understanding of adopting the shape of the guardian animal of one's own animal totem. To wonder about in the spiritual sphere, the exact same concept within Seidre. Hemingia probably derived from Ham Gengia, originally referring to people who can change their Hammer. 
So in this sense, Hemingia is related to people who are able to change their shape. Hamra, shape, appearance or shell. And Gengia, to walk in shapes, shape walk, walking in an, another physical form. So quite possibly the concept of the Hemingia as the personification of the look of a person originated from this notion of a protective spirit, from the notion that the soul could take on physical shape outside the body. Because it's also stated uh, in the sources after the death of a person, that person's Hemingia could be transferred to another person, just like the Filigia. The Filia is the spiritual personification of a person with its own individual existence that can either move on to its own affairs after a person dies or can be adopted by another individual or a group of individuals. For instance, the animal totem of the berserkers was the bear. The bear was their Filia. The animal totem of the Hulfadnar was a wolf. The wolf was their Filia. So if Emilia is the force of, of the individual residing in the Filia, this force can also be lent to another person. And that's exactly where I want to get. One of the first things that is spoken about the Emilia in the sources is that Emilia could be given to another. When a person dies, that person's Hemingia is often reincarnated in one of his or her descendants, but especially if to a child it is given the name of the original owner of the Hemingia. And yes, I repeat, the Hemingia reincarnates on another person. When some of you asked me uh, if there was a concept or the concept of reincarnation in pre-Christian Scandinavian beliefs, this is it. Hemingia is the closest thing we have to the perception of reincarnation in Old Norse beliefs. Now, this is very important. You give a child the name of an ancestor to absorb the Hemingia of that ancestor, to absorb the essence of the ancestor, and therefore the child absorbs the luck and other qualities of that ancestor. To understand spiritual concepts of European pagan traditions that have been heavily influenced by Christianity and other such religions, we must find tribal parallels of remote communities whose mythologies still retain a very shamanic understanding of the world. So I found within the Inuit mythology and spirituality, a very important concept that resembles the Hemingia and this notion that can be given to another person. The Inuit are the indigenous peoples of the Arctic regions of Greenland, Canada and Alaska. In their shamanic uh, spiritual perceptions, they have a dualistic concept of the soul. They associate the first soul with breathing. And the second soul is the personal one. And in order to make the personal soul strong, they sought protective measures and guardianship by acquiring the name of a dead relative. Some Inuit even gave more than 15 ancestors names to their children to assure protection, as well as to continue the lives of the departed. This system of belief resembles a form of reincarnation. This is the exact same thing as the concept of the Hemingia. It is part of the essence of a person, and when that person dies, giving the name of that person to one of the descendants not only ensures that the person continues to live reincarnated on the descendant, but also all the qualities of the dead ancestor are reincarnated on the descendant, including the luck which we shall develop further ahead the meaning of this luck. Now, take special notice that to the Inuit, the first soul is associated with breathing. To the Norse, hond was the breath. It was the energy that gave life to something. That energy can be felt on the Megin, which is the essence of a person. As I have stated on the previous video about Megin, it is the very essence that composes the soul of a person. Megin is the same thing as mana and the same thing of the Inuit Sila. 
Sila is the Inuit deity of the sky, the wind and the weather. Sila is the breath of the world. Consequently, Sila is also similar to mana or heather. Sila is the substance of which all souls are made of. So through breath, the substance of the soul is created. Breath is intimately tied with Sila. In the Norse perspective, Hond, the breath, created Megin, the spiritual essence, the substance of the soul. And here we have parallels between indigenous Arctic spiritual concepts with pre-Christian Scandinavian concepts. Now, Sila is the first soul, as Megin is the spiritual essence. Sila influences the second soul, as Megin influences the Hemingya. Hemingya is composed by the Megin of a person, by the spiritual essence, which upon death, this Megin will be lent to another person. That person will die and give his own Megin and the Megin of his ancestor to another person, and on and on it goes. The junction of the Megin of various ancestors forms the Hemingya, and the Hemingya one receives is the entire series of each of the Megin of our ancestors. Therefore, Hemingya is the abilities, essence, skills of all of our ancestors, and therefore we acquire their luck, the force which is the result of the personalities of various ancestors that influence us positively or negatively. And this perspective is related to fate and destiny, weird and her law. That's what we are going to talk about next, in relation to the Emingia. Emingia was the force that was believed to run through the family. The lifestyle and conduct of the family affected the Emingia in a good way or in a bad way. Take Emingia as the reputation of a family, for instance. If there is a good deed or a bad deed, that family will be remembered for their actions. Those actions become reputation and that follows the family's next generation. The new generation will either have a stigma upon them or a good indicator. They will continue to have their own actions which can either augment the previous reputation or can make some alterations. These new actions will be carried out to the next generation, and on it goes. Eminge is very much like this. If you inherit the Eminge of your ancestors, that will influence your personality. Just as reputation can affect the entire future of the family and influence the actions of one family member that can create good or bad, Eminge will also affect in the same way and it is expressed in the individual as luck. To the Norse, there was the belief that we are the descendants of the gods. So if we carry the essence of the gods, each individual is an extension of the divine. If we, if we inherit the Eminge of the gods, this gave people a certain sense of responsibility. And so to acquire the Eminge was to attempt to lead a worthy life to eventually lead the entire collective soul of the family back to the gods. If a particular family inherited the Eminge of a specific deity upon death, they would reside on the halls of that deity. But they had to live a life accordingly, an honorable life, to be worthy to return to the gods. Now, this becomes very difficult because in terms of fate, there are certain things people can't change. You cannot change your ancestors, your roots cannot be changed. Therefore, you inherit the entire past of your ancestors and their actions will influence your life. The place where you were born, the circumstances, the life you have. You inherit what cannot be changed. You inherit the Hemingia of your ancestors. If they have had terrible past choice choices that affects the Emingia, then what you receive is not a good amount of luck. Your amount of luck is determined by the past actions of your ancestors, by the fate that cannot be changed, by the circumstances that cannot be changed. This is why the more positive, honorable, worthy actions you have, 
the better luck your descendants will have. You worked hard to acquire a property, your descendant will enjoy whatever comes from that property. Your descendant plants fruits, uh, fruit trees on the property, the next generation will enjoy the fruits, and on and on it goes. This is the meaning of the luck in Emingia. A worthy life, an honorable life, and you become a better person. And since you are going to reincarnate on your descendants, because your Hemingia is passed on to them, the next person will be even better if that person continues to live an honorable life with good and right actions. Each generation is walking towards a better very, uh, version of one's self until they reach Godwood. And I believe this is why the original meaning of Hemingya might have come from Ham Gengya, to walk in shapes, because you continue to live in your descendants, so you are always changing from shape to shape. You continue to walk the process of evolution through time uh, on the shape of another until you are worthy enough and change to the shape of a god when you can finally rest among the gods, among those who had a great amount of good luck, a great amount of good Emingia. Emingia becomes the total amount of power and illumination a person is in possession of. So it would seem that Emingia can be seen as a supernatural power that some people can achieve, and with such a power one can change the Hamr, the shape, and by doing so, being connected to his or her filia, which in turn will make a person more knowledgeable, more resilient, more powerful. The Emingia is empowered when the other aspects of the soul are awakened, the other parts of the self, when you are conscious of their existence and can create a balance between all the aspects. In this, in this aspect, Emingia, in the perspective of luck, was a quality inherited in the individual and one's lineage, a part of one's personality connected to strength, intelligence and abilities both physical and mental, which will lead to success, wealth and power, not only of the individual but of the family as well. But as I've said on the previous video, I would like to reinforce that Hemingia is not the sort of luck that takes away one's accomplishments or something that limits us to a sealed fate. Luck has nothing to do with that. Certainly, if you inherit the luck, the Emingia of your ancestors, you already have a great advantage over others whose Emingia is low due to their ancestors' negative and wrong actions. But it's your responsibility towards your ancestors, your living relatives and yourself to continue the flow of good luck to continue to have worthy actions to enhance the positivity in your Hemingia. Our abilities are our own, our skills, our power and knowledge, all acquired not through luck, but through hard work. Luck is just a power that influences circumstances, and we take advantage of those circumstances and act accordingly if we are smart and put to practice our own wisdom. Alright my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video and I do hope I was clear enough in explaining this concept because it is indeed quite complex. Maybe one of these days I shall speak about the written sources and show you some examples so you can better understand Hemingia in the sense of luck and how it was applied. The explanation I've presented you in this video was more of a spiritual understanding by the interpretations we can develop through the studies of the sources. Thank you so much for watching, see you on the next video and talk for you